Let us pray. Most gracious heavenly God, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto you. Amen. Well, we've, we've been here several months, and, and y'all are getting used to me, and I, I'm getting used to y'all. And there's some things you've probably learned about me by now, is that I really love stories, and I really like movies. And so, you know, there are certain movies that they just, I watch them a bunch of times. If they're on and I walk by, I'll sit down and watch them. It does not matter how many times I have seen it. You can ask my wife. I, I do know there are people that occasionally stop my wife and go, is that really true? Yes, it is. So there, there she goes. She can give you testimony right now. Now, there's a reason certain movies, certain stories are our favorites, and it has to do with who we are. It, it has to do with what our heartstrings are tuned to or what our heartstrings play on their own. And the best example I can give of this is, you know, a piano is filled with strings, uh, and they're all tuned to different notes. Hopefully they are tuned to a note. That's why you have somebody come by with a piano hammer and they tune it. And so it plays certain notes on certain strings. Now you may not know this, but when I was learning the saxophone and used to practice uh, to my parents' uh, dismay, I would sit on the piano bench in our living room and I would play the saxophone. And when I got notes right, the piano would sing the note back to me in a sympathetic vibration. Uh, because I played a C, the piano string would begin to vibrate a C. And as you would run the scales, each of them would play the note. Now, the reason that they would play that note is they were tuned to that note. Our heart, our heart is tuned to certain notes. And so when we see them in certain stories, there's a reason they resonate with us. Now, now the stories, some of the movies I really like are, uh, I really like Seabiscuit, uh, The Exotic Marigold Hotel, um, Invincible. Do y'all know some of these? Y'all are all shaking here. Maybe you don't know any of these. And, and I'll tell you what's, what's in common with all of these stories. Uh, the Larry Crown, uh, and, and I'll watch most of these several times is because they are the story of when people have something really broken in their world, something goes wrong, something changes, and what was working quit working. They came to a dead-end place in life. They came to a place where things had to change or their life was over. And, you know, one of the, things, the hardest things in life is to go through transformation. It is to be changed. And so I just really love these stories of change. And anybody want to guess why as a preacher that I love the story of transformation and change? And y'all better get this one right. <laughs> because that is the miracle of miracles that humans would change. Trust me. For us to be transformed into the likeness of Christ to be changed in who we really are supposed to be is a miracle, and that is the calling of the gospel. So the reason those stories resonate with me, the reason I love them, is because it is the movement of the gospel in our lives. And so you know, whenever I've had a really bad week, anybody ever have a really bad week? A really, you're ready to give up? Sometimes I'll come home and I'll put one of those movies in and I'll watch it and I am looking forward to that somebody's life is going to change. I need that to press on in life. Anybody ever need to hear the stories that make you continue to move forward? Yeah, we all do. We all need those stories. Sometimes my wife watches me uh, put in a movie and she goes, is that going to be in this week's sermon? You act like I know what I'm going to preach. I do by the time I write it, but during the week, I don't. So any of that brings me to the passage of Ezekiel. We need to talk a little bit about that. That is a very interesting passage. 
It is uh, apocalyptic in its nature as literature, which means it's a different kind of literature than we're used to. Uh, and it is uh, kind of very beautiful, I think, in its language from this particular standpoint. It says that he was in a place and God took him there in a vision. That is, he is transported to a place. I wanted to look up where the Valley of the Dry Bones is. It's somewhere that God took him. So it's not a place that I can go put my finger on a map. So he is taken to a place in a vision, and there upon it he looks, and there's just bones everywhere. Now I kind of envision there's been a great battle, and there's been vultures, and all you got are bleached out bones, or there's just a cemetery with everything turned up, but there's all these dead bones. And God asks him a question. Can these bones live again? Now, I love his answer. Like I know. His answer is, God, you know. Why are you asking me this question? To which then God gives him this particular assignment. Your job is is to preach, which is prophesize, your job is to preach to the dead bones. Trust me, if there was a preacher in the room, he would resonate with that. <laughs> You're like, come on, folks. Preach to dead bones. Now, I've had some interesting and strange preaching assignments. Uh, over time, we did COVID, and uh, the first week I was preaching to an empty congregation. We were just online. Y'all remember that? I think we had like 5,000 people watch that first sermon that week. They're all wondering, is Jesus coming this week, preacher? That's what y'all wanted to know. But the assignment is to preach to these dead bones, and they're going to change something. When I was in seminary and I was... Uh, learning to preach, which I'm still learning to preach, so don't give up on me yet. But I would, I would write my sermon, and I would, I would give it, and they're really, you ever embarrassed to have to speak in front of people and embarrassed to hear your own voice? It was painful. So I took uh, our then Cocker Spaniel and put him on the couch, Sully, and I would preach to my dog. Honest to gosh truth. And if the dog stayed awake, I knew I was onto something. <laughs> Man, if I can keep the dog up. Not sure he got the theology, but he was awake. But God's assignment was preach to these bones, and it's going to change things. You know, that's the truth. How did all of creation happen? By word. God spoke, and all of creation happened. Words are powerful. They bring life. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The job of worship, the job of preaching, is to bring life into us so that we may live. So we're called to preach, to bring into life. Now, this passage also goes over uh, the word breath is used many times. It's the Hebrew word ruha, which means spirit, breath, wind. They're all one. So a wind blew through the valley. It's like Pentecost for the Old Testament. And the bones were put together and the sinew put on it. And then they breathed and then they came to life and they lived. God was telling Ezekiel, your job is not to whine. Your job is to preach because people need to hear it so that they might live because they are perishing out in the world. We, we need to hear that God is with us. One, one of the things that I always remember whenever we do communion is I say, the Lord be with you. Okay, we can do better. The Lord be with you. There you go. I feel so much better. Now, here's where that came from. If you were a, a Jewish farmer or you had your out in the first century, your greeting, if you saw one of your fellow men walking through the field, would be, the Lord be with you. And they would yell back, also with you. It was a greeting. 
used in everyday language. And it says this, if you have the Lord with you, then you know salvation. It's basically, may you have salvation because God is with you. May you live. And the answer back, may you live as well. I, I think we're a little asleep when I say, the Lord be with you. Just answer it every time. You're a good Methodist. You can do it. Uh, I, I hate to bring the sports metaphor into it, but I'd rather it was more like yell practice than a sleep practice. Whoop, thank you. God bless us. So, so here we are through Ezekiel, and then the people are brought to life and they live. You know, this has been a really good week for me. Um, we went on retreat. Uh, last week, I went to a, a worship service at First Conroe, which was the church I grew up in. Uh, our daughter and son-in-law joined that church. That was exciting. He preached a really good sermon, John Wayne did. A and then we went on retreat. And basically, all we did on retreat was worship or rest. Man, you want to talk about a good week. We worshiped and rested. Oh, we ate too. We're good Methodist. And I felt really energized from all that. Now, I know some of y'all probably had a worse week than I did. Because it's life. Like the week before was not so good. But worship and rest brings us back into life. So we, we come to the passage here um, with Lazarus. Uh, which is an interesting passage to deal with. In the book of John, as I've told y'all several times, we've been working our way through John, it's very much a book uh, that is put in a way for theological reasons to point to certain ideas. Now, in the book of John, there are seven miracles, and the seven miracles point to each other and point out something. There's eight if you include Jesus' resurrection uh, on the uh, beginning of the new creation day, but there's seven others. The beginning is water and wine, right? And the last one here is Lazarus. The one that's right in the middle is the feeding of 5,000. The kind of crescendo throughout this. There's seven other things, the seven I am's, the seven names for Jesus. So all through the book of John, he keeps repeating on this seven idea. Now, we didn't read all of the, the Lazarus story because it is the entire chapter, 11th chapter. So I wanted to have a few minutes to preach. So we, we didn't go through the whole part. But there's some interesting parts in there that I want to point to. One is that Jesus waited, Jesus waited until Lazarus had died. Jesus waited till he was gone. And then he went. You know, I, I think before things change in our life, sometimes we got to die. There's stuff we got to die to. There's, I, we got to hit bottom. Anybody ever have to find bottom before they found their way back up? Bottom, we have to run out of our own resources. We have to be completely beaten up. We have to be exhausted. And then at that point, we finally go, well, I guess maybe God's will should be done. I, I think God will let us go into the grave so that we can be born again. So here Lazarus is, he's been there long enough, and then it says what? He's been there long enough to smell bad. If you've ever been at the bottom, you've been there long enough to smell bad. I, I can tell you, I've got my own Jonah story, it stinketh in the belly of the whale. I'm like, man, there's a detail that resonates. It smells bad in there, man. And so then, Jesus said, roll away the stone. You know, often what we need is the thing that's causing death in our life to be rolled out of the way. We, we need something rolled out of the way so that we may be called to life. And then Jesus, what does he do? He calls out to Lazarus and says, come out of the tomb. You know, he says that to all of us. That's not just for Lazarus. It is a personal message for every person who's ever walked is for each of us need to come out of the place of death in our life. 
so that we may live a new life. Come out of the tomb, man. Come on out. And Lazarus comes out, and then what does his friends do? Unbind him. You know, there's stones in our way that keep us from living the life that we should have, and there is bondage that is in our way that keeps us from living into the fullness of life. And what does Jesus say to them? Get the stone out of the way, get the bindings off of you, because to be made new in Christ often requires, and I think it pretty much requires, that we surrender. We surrender our old ways. We surrender how we do it. So that God is not only Lord, excuse me, not only Savior, but our Lord as well. Jesus has to become our Lord and then our Savior, and then he defeats the power over sin and death. The power that takes place in his crucifixion and resurrection is the breaking of the power over sin and death, and the miracle of Lazarus points to that coming. So Jesus invites us, come out. Come out and live anew. You know, one of the things that I I really love about being Methodist is not only the idea of grace, as we have a very high emphasis on grace, we also have a very high emphasis on sanctification, which is a big fancy word for living anew in Christ, being transformed in the likeness of Christ so that we live a new life in this world. John Wesley said, don't ever give up on perfection in this life. You can have it. Now, I'll tell you the road to it. It's through submission. If you want to see God do something powerful, submit to God's will. God can do powerful things in your life if you don't submit. I just don't see it happen very often. Where I see power in people's lives are when we submit to what God has called us to. So I want to tell one story and, le- and, and, and hopefully bring this all together. Uh, it's not a particularly long story. Uh, before I became uh, called fully into full-time ministry, I used to go do prison ministry over at the East Ham Unit. East Ham Unit was written up as one of the worst prisons in the United States. At the time, there were quite a few riots. Somebody got stabbed every day. It's kind of a rough place. Um, and the way, they, the way they do prisons is there's different tiers, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, you know, that way. And A is administrative segregation. You probably know it as solitary confinement, where you are there by yourself 23 hours a day. They let you out for a shower, a little bit of a jog for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then you go back to your cell. And the reason they put you there is because you cannot behave out in, like, the world, you can't behave in prison, you can't behave in supervision, we're going to just lock you up because you can't behave. So we were going around doing prison ministry cell to cell, and a friend of mine was doing a cell. Uh, I was down the tier from him, and a a young man was speaking to him, and uh, this is the story he relayed to me about it, was this young man said, I want you to know I'm about to get my life together. I'm going to change the way I live. I'm going to do things differently. Uh, I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to hold a job. I'm going to go be a regular citizen. And and he talked about all the things he was going to do. And my friend looked at him straight in the eye, and he says, you need to know something. You can't do it. I, I got a newsflash for you. You can't pull it off. He said, you know, you're lying to yourself. You need to realize that if there is a bottom of the barrel to this planet, you have arrived. Here you are. You can't run your own life. In fact, all the evidence of how well you've run your own life, look where it's got you. What you need to do is let God run your life. You need to surrender to God's will in your life and you will be amazed at how you live then. Because Jesus is calling that man out of the tomb as well. And he was living in one. Folks, 
we all live in a tomb. But God invites us out. He invites us to walk away from some things so that we may live fully in the presence with Christ. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.